I played Spyro 2 for countless hours as a child and teenager, and I thought it was alright. I'm a huge fan of 3D platformers, but something about it just didn't click with me. Its design, its challenges, and its collectibles felt incredibly arbitrary, especially next to competitors like Jack and Daxter, or Insomniac's own Ratchet and Clank series. Hell, even Banjo-Kazooie seemingly put much more effort into making its universe sensible and cohesive. I also owned and played Spyro into the Dragonfly around the same time. From what I recalled, the games were nearly indistinguishable, so I was plenty surprised years later when I found out exactly how despised Into the Dragonfly really is. And in spite of my digging, I couldn't find any convincing reasons as to why, beyond its technical issues. Anyway, all the things that make Spyro, Spyro, seemed to be present in Enter the Dragonfly. Is it really so awful? Don't I owe my childhood self another look at the game? We should give it a spin. But, it wouldn't be fair without a refresher on the first three games. So I rented the Reignited Trilogy from Gamefly, and I'll be playing through it to get a good comparison. Before we jump in, fair warning, this video's probably gonna be full of hot takes. But honestly, they probably shouldn't be hot takes. And no, I don't mean that my opinions are just so good that no one should disagree with them. I'm not quite that arrogant. I mean that, at the end of the day, this is my opinion about a series of fictional worlds. My enjoyment, or lack thereof, shouldn't have a thing to do with your own. Be yourself and love what you love. Alright, let's get started. Tackling the original Spyro the Dragon, or at least its remade version, it's easy to see why the series has such a lasting impact. It's a traditional 3D platformer collectathon, sure, but it blows much of its competition clean out of the water with its inventive level design and inspired moveset, which rings surprising depth from its simplicity. Spyro can jump, glide, charge, and breathe fire. Each of these moves is simple to perform, simple to master, but the environment and enemy types are expertly crafted to squeeze them dry of potential. The combat encounters in this game feel like genuine challenges, with enemies spaced at perfect distances from the player and each other to encourage rapid strategizing and frantic switching between combat abilities. The enemy types are all basic, some block your flame and some block your charge, for example, but it's astonishing how well the game configures their placement to present thoughtful obstacles. Spyro's moveset is also well explored by the level design, which I found startlingly clever. The levels in Spyro are pseudo-linear, in that they follow a clear path from beginning point to an end point, but somewhere along the way, usually when you reach the end, they either loop back on themselves or provide a new perspective for you to look back with. This new perspective reveals hidden depths to the level design and opens them up, transforming them into exploration-focused, collectible hunts. Every bit of space in a level has immense value, and nothing exists superfluously. Dry Canyon, in particular, is really spectacular, requiring not only optimal usage of Spyro's glide, but intimate knowledge of the topography. The actual collectibles deserve some praise, too. I mean, they talk to you, and each of them has a unique design. Some of them even provide insight to dragon culture or lore, but uh, that's unfortunately a bit rare. I still have no idea what a beast maker even is, because the exposition provided is just so minimal. All too often the dragons just say thank you and zip away. That less than thorough attention to narrative detail is present in most of the story. But it's still not the bare minimum. The places you visit in this game are locations the dragons genuinely live in, gems have a reason to exist and a reason to be collected, and the backstory is sensible for both the heroes and villains alike, however deliberately cartoonish it might be. Spyro the Dragon is an excellent example of doing so very much with so very little. Its minimalist moveset and straightforward approach to game structure might seem underwhelming at first, but it uses what it has to its fullest potential. But Yay! 
Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage is a game which has pretensions of being a 3D platformer collectathon, and on the surface it appears as one. You jump, you run around levels grabbing doodads, you attack enemies. Seems right. It also has pretensions of being a sequel, and again appears as one superficially. But its structure is almost entirely different from its predecessor, to the point it feels like a completely off-the-wall experience. To start with, we leave the Dragon Realms entirely to head to Avalar. What is Avalar? Why are there so many discordant worlds connected to it through these portals? Why does everyone assume Spyro is on board with their plan to save Avalar? What is Ripto's deal? Why is he hiding from Spyro instead of confronting him directly? Why do almost none of the in-level conflicts have anything to do with Ripto's supposed rage? Why are there gems lying around everywhere? You might figure the NPCs would explain some of this, but most of their dialogue is either forgettable tutorial jargon, completely empty of personality, or just oddly mean. The general tone of Spyro 2 is cruel and a bit childish, in contrast with the pure-hearted approach of its predecessor. In Spyro 2, you get these little cutscenes at the beginning and end of levels where you witness something stupid, cruel, violent, or all three. Then the characters inside the level behave just as terribly. Sure, let's not rescue your chief because he's a living person and deserves it. Let's rescue him because he's got tickets you want. Many of the NPCs are just jerks, and as soon as you're dropped into a setting, Spyro arbitrarily picks a side in their ongoing conflicts without context. Help this child infiltrate and demolish a sacred temple? Sure, why not? And even when you do help these awful people, they're in trouble again as soon as you leave the world and return, as though you were never there. And it's not just Spyro 2's tone and story that are different, either. In the original Spyro, you were rewarded collectibles for exploring the levels and platforming. In this game, though, no such luck. Almost every plot-important collectible is hidden behind a minigame of some variety. These minigames detract from the overall design, not enhance it. Even though they're kept in the same play area as the main levels, they also feel segregated from the world through their unique colored text and difficulty rating, which basically tells you that you're about to start playing another game entirely. The first Spyro was all about exploring the minimalist mechanics to their fullest potential, and Spyro 2 is about introducing new, trivial one-off mechanics that are either unexplored entirely, or explored in segregated sections independent of the overall level flow. Escorting the turtles is barely a mechanic in its own level, and dedicating an entire minigame to exploring it is obtrusive and utterly lacks grace. It doesn't help that the minigames are often plain bad, meaningless, or confusing. Why does breaking all the pillars make these NPCs chant better? Weren't they already trying to chant before I did that? How does knocking them off help? Why do these hungry lizards try to eat the farthest caveman away from them instead of the closest? Why does Hunter take the longest imaginable path between the monkeys he's collecting? And oh boy, here's the best one! When I'm escorting the alchemist, why does he actively try to get himself hit by the enemies? He actually walks straight toward them in a clear attempt to take damage. I've never screamed so loud at a character in a video game. And you might say, Addy, listen, the characters are behaving that way because it's a video game. And these are video game challenges. That's not good enough. Write better characters and better excuses. These aren't people Spyro's helping out. They're comically inept jerks whose sapience is quite questionable. This is exactly what I mean by arbitrary. Why is everyone stupid in Spyro 2? Just cuz. Why are there minigames everywhere now? Just cuz. Why anything? Just cuz. The first game put some effort into explaining why and how things were happening. Spyro 2, though, looks at the concept of context, the idea of sensible reason, and runs screaming the opposite direction. It turns out these little things that bothered me as a child have gotten much more frustrating as an adult. But surely there's more, right? There are some redeeming qualities and good carried over from the first game? Well, kinda. In Spyro 2, the level layout still loops back on itself with a new perspective, just like in the first game. 
However, in this one you are often directly told to loop back with a new perspective, instead of it happening naturally through exploration. It loses a lot of the pleasure when it feels explicitly guided like this. And I really can't think of anything nice to say. Spyro 2 tried to do everything the first game did, and more, but also did it worse. Where thorough exploration of the mechanics was once skillfully woven into the level design, it's now behind senseless minigame barriers and yammering NPCs. NPCs who have nothing to say, and who are at best tangentially related to the ongoing narrative. Spyro 1 functions as a simple fable, with spectacular game design and a thorough understanding of its strict limitations. Spyro 2 is a convoluted mess, with unexplored mechanics and plot threads dangling loosely all over the place. I may have played it tons as a child, but I'm quite over it now. Blech. Spyro 3 Year of the Dragon is a wonderful accomplishment, for quite a few reasons. It's got the best design in the trilogy, combining elements of both the first two games in nearly flawless harmony. First most, the exploration focus is back, baby. The collectibles are no longer exclusively locked behind infuriating minigames, and can now also be found through clever pathfinding and natural discovery just like in the good old days of Spyro 1. That's not to say the minigames are gone, but guess what? They're also much better here than in Spyro 2. The minigame segregation is more clearly defined in Year of the Dragon. You literally have to trot through a dark void to access the minigames, and oftentimes the minigames aren't built around new mechanics, but instead are focused on using existing ones to their fullest potential. Even when new mechanics are introduced, the level design is carefully crafted to utilize them properly. The triviality is gone, it's now just real variety with real game design. Cutscenes are back too, but are placed in much more sensible places and have much clearer purpose. What's this? Real character development in a Spyro game. Friendly allies who are competent, enjoyable to interact with, and full of personality, an ongoing narrative with stakes and focus, hot damn. Spyro 3 also touches up the elements which were most ignored in the two prequels. For example, the hub areas now feel much more substantial and dynamic. They could pass for actual levels on their own, and are just as thoughtfully designed around Spyro's movement. The bosses are seriously threatening and creative, too, with some of them having surprisingly effective counters to your moves, requiring deliberate circumvention of your shortcomings if you wish to succeed. And the collectibles feel like a genuine reward for exploring this time, which is something both Spyro 1 and 2 sometimes had trouble with. Almost every praise I had for the original Spyro applies here, and more. Almost. Because, well, it's not all great, exactly. The collectibles have really stupid reasons to be where they are, unlike the original game. Oh, what's that? You used a precious dragon egg to test your high-speed water tunnel? Fucking excuse me, but why? The NPCs can also still be assholes for no reason, which still isn't what I'd consider charming, especially when it serves no greater tone or purpose. Thankfully, that's all relatively minor nitpicks in the grand scheme of things. Spyro 3 won't win any awards for writing, but it kicks ass in every other field of play, appealing to the sensibilities of both its prequels in the best way imaginable. It's finally time. We're here, at long last, with Spyro 4, Enter the Dragonfly. And really, my stated impression seems to hold up pretty well. This game is a Spyro game, and it feels like one on many fronts. Let's go through them. Pseudo-linear circular level design that loops back on itself? Check. Countless minigames only tangentially related to the ongoing narrative? Check. 
Varied, wacky world themes full of colorful enemies. Check. Considered exploration of Spyro's unique, simplistic moveset and physics. Check. Not only does Enter the Dragonfly contain these elements, it uses them respectfully. High-speed chasing egg thieves is as exhilarating as ever. Nabbing uniquely named collectibles, each with their own voice clip, is still incredibly charming. And the minigames, uh, I mean, they're still many games. They all work and I don't hate them. Some of them even take unexpected directions. One minigame in particular, Platform Peril, is a floating platform maze with a strikingly mystical and otherworldly atmosphere. Not only that, it's the best platforming gauntlet in any of the four Spyro games discussed in this video. It requires excellent understanding of your momentum and pathfinding abilities to surpass. As to the level design as a whole, Enter the Dragonfly certainly understood its predecessors well. The levels start linear, but as you progress, they loop back in on themselves in creative and exciting ways, which is the series' staple. Two levels in particular, Luau Island and Cloud Nine, best exemplify this trait. In Luau Island, you can already see unreachable areas at the very start, suspended vertically away from you. And when you break through the first gate, you're introduced to the level's design philosophy. The layout is a series of interconnected circular hubs, wherein you traverse underwater, above water, or in the air to discover hidden alcoves, collectibles, and entirely new hubs. The level is also full of unique geometry, clever pathfinding, and clear landmarks. It's quite memorable. As to Cloud 9, it's an even more traditional Spyro experience. It seems startlingly linear at first, until you begin to look more closely around you at the floating platforms to your sides. You might find yourself asking, I couldn't possibly reach that, could I? And the answer is actually yes, you always can reach that, if you glide just right. And because the level takes place in such open space, almost everywhere you can glide connects seamlessly with everywhere else. So yeah, Enter the Dragonfly has got Spyro's spirit down. But more than just rehash and reconsider old ideas, it also contains many new ones. Most noticeably, there are multiple breath types. Spyro can now breathe bubbles, lightning, ice, and of course, uh, fire. The new breath types interact with enemies and the environment in distinct ways, but it's also very rudimentary. None of the uses for the various new moves are going to blow anyone's mind, but the game's got that in common with Spyro 2 at least. Somewhere Enter the Dragonfly genuinely did innovate is with its collectibles. Enter the Dragonfly turns collectibles into a challenge. It's not enough just to locate baby dragonflies, you also have to physically chase them down and capture them. There's immense opportunity for the devs to design level geometry around these fleeing collectibles, and the chance wasn't wasted. If you're good enough at preempting their movement, it can also leave you feeling pretty fucking satisfied. Yeah, you little bitch, I read you hard. You're getting bubbled. This is an extra level of engagement that's just unique to enter the dragonfly. And there is a reason we're running around nabbing baby dragonflies, obviously. Ripto's come back, and he's used magic to scatter them all across the dragon realms. Is the plot particularly enjoyable or impactful? Uh, no, certainly not, especially not in comparison to Spyro 3. But it's also much less arbitrary and needlessly convoluted than Spyro 2. Ripto's scattered dragonflies, go get them. That's about it. So far, I've been practically all sunshine about Spyro 4, you might have noticed. That's not because it's perfect, not by any stretch of the imagination. For one thing, the hub world is tragically bad. It's a series of loosely connected, loosely themed squares where you run around blasting dummies. No creative platforming or exploration is required. It's about as empty and soulless as a hub area could be. It's also the only hub area, and that's because Enter the Dragonfly is short on levels. Spyro 1 had 18 main levels, Spyro 2 had 17 main levels, and Spyro 3 had 24. Enter the Dragonfly has 8. If you ask me, that's more than enough, especially considering their size, but fans used to the sheer amount of variety in previous games might understandably be disappointed. The worst aspects of Enter the Dragonfly exist entirely outside of its design, though. 
the game has a hard time functioning. There were plenty of moments it performed so badly that I was legitimately fearful it would crash. The frame rate is so terribly erratic that it makes high-speed gameplay unintentionally harrowing, and some of the audio glitches are just plain bizarre. One time, ghostly voices started speaking to me when I was nowhere near an NPC. That, it appears, it, those rip talks don't seem to be much of a challenge for you. Perhaps you should contemplate a career as a dragon sensei. It could be your density. I mean, your destiny. Now, I will open that gate. In compassion, money still has my soul. So, what's the verdict? How's it all come together? Frankly, I'm ready to say Enter the Dragonfly is better than Spyro 2, at least. It doesn't overcome Spyro 3 or 1, but it does still manage to do a couple things better. Making the collectibles interactable was a stroke of genius, and I adore the perfect balance between exploration and minigames. Plus, again, the floating platform maze. Enter the Dragonfly feels like a perfectly natural title in the series. I'm glad I took the time to revisit it and discover a worthwhile experience. Whew, this one was a doozy. I do have a couple notes here. Uh, if you plan to play the Reignited trilogy instead of the original games, be aware there are some differences. Most notably, Spyro controls way smoother in the remasters. That may seem like a positive, but the stiffer controls in the PS1 releases were there for a reason, and I'm not a fan of the way Reignited tampers with some of Spyro's unique physics. If you buy the Reignited trilogy on physical media, you also have to download a massive patch to even gain access to the second and third games. And if you intend to play Enter the Dragonfly, it does matter whether you pick GameCube or PS2. GameCube seems to run much better, but it's also missing a lot of graphical effects and presentational flair present in the PS2 release. Overall gameplay is the same, though. Very lastly, I'm aware there's cut content that would have explained and provided context for the levels and story in Spyro 2, but it's not in the game, and it's not in the remaster either. I can't give Spyro 2 credit for something that's plain not there. With that out of the way, it's time to thank the lovely folks supporting my Patreon and making larger videos like this more viable. My wonderful supporters are... Ipompus, Anonymous, J. Marth Sinclair, Mighty Minimalist Power Rangers, Sam Anderson, Some Call Me Anto, and Waposa. A link to the Patreon is in the description. Thank you all so much for your time and thoughts, and I'll talk to you in the next video.